2020 was crazy for reasons. And as we get to the other side of this pandemic and most of us are getting vaccinated, we can start going back outside and eating food off of the ground and making fun of our uncles for being just racist and not racist and anti-vaxxers. But we spent so many months with our AI assistants and being bored and trying desperately to do anything to remind ourselves that we're not in the middle of the goddamn apocalypse. That pain, that moment that we all lived through. What if we took that and we made it a game show. Well, long before the pandemic, Fox Reality beat us to it. In June of 2006, Fox Reality launched a new show called Solitary, an entire game show based around isolating human beings and seeing how long they could live in this social experiment. And after everything we've been through, I am ready to sit down on the couch and watch other people experience what I experienced for the amusement of my own entertainment because I'm American and can't afford therapy. These nine contestants locked inside of the room had one goal, to last until the end, to be the strongest out of the group. And at the end, the winner would get $50,000 for having gone through weeks of emotional trauma and torment, which is about how much you would pay to go to therapy, so we're gonna count it as good. On paper, it doesn't sound that bad. You get a small amount of, albeit flavorless, food. Sort of nasty, but better than bugs, right? You get some water, you get a little bit of a blanket or bedtime here and there, but honestly, just being isolated for that long doesn't seem that bad. I mean, hell, we just did it. But I guess that's not everything that's inside this game show. Uh, actually, I'm missing one really big thing. Listen carefully. My name is Val. The pod you are in has been designed for total isolation. While there are nine of you participating in this experiment, you will never see or communicate with each other in any way. I am your only companion. In solitary, I am your only friend. That's right, straight out of the Aperture Laboratories handbook, there is an artificial rogue intelligence that is trying desperately to test you, poke you, prod you, and see exactly how far you'll go. Val, as it is known, is not only the creator of these sadistic tasks and goals, but it's also the only friend and companion that the contestants have through their entire few weeks. So grab some popcorn, grab a drink, sit back and relax as we explore season one of Solitary, a show where everybody laughed at the premise because who would ever do that to themselves? That could never happen to, <laughs> that could never happen to me. So the show itself was considered a social experiment to not only see who could last the longest out of nine contestants, but who could last the longest against themselves. A lot of the show was pitting yourself against your own limits, your own boundaries. And it's a theme that's touched on the entire show. It's not about beating the other contestants. It's about beating yourself. How far can you go before your body or your mind cracks? The players start off in a 10 foot padded room and honestly, just looking at it, it feels claustrophobic. They're given a number instead of a name and they are only able to use the bathroom upon request and whenever Val decides that it's time. So you can tell that very quickly, this is grating as hell. How come one goes orange or cherries? So besides their main room, there's actually a side room that not only has the bathrooms, but it also has like a little confession booth where they can talk to the camera directly and get some good reality TV show B-roll. I'm not gonna go through all of the characters in the show. You'll learn a lot of them as you watch. And to be honest, there's not that many that are memorable, but those that are, are, and you'll see them soon. Needless to say, all of these people were incredibly tough and strong to be able to even go through this for as long as they did. For now, there's only one big thing to point out, which is that there are treatments. Treatments are kind of like survivor challenges. Players are forced to go through and experience some horrific thing for a long amount of time and see who can come out on top. The catch of the entire show, like I said, the theme is based around your own personal perseverance. You don't know when the other contestants have quit. Yeah, that's right. Contestants have no idea when anybody else drops out, and the whole challenge is to see how long can you last, because if you're the first person to drop out, you are done. You leave the show. So the very first challenge that Val puts the players through is to see what items of the other player's personal belongings would you like to take. Number six is a 25-year-old stunt person with an obsession for hair gel. <laughs> okay. 
I'd like to take away the hand mirror from hair gel boy number six because we have enough mirrors in this pod. The resistance band and the tennis ball. All the number six stuff is, is his own. I don't want to take anything away from number six. None. Please take away all three. And at the end of the whole thing, after taking all of those items away from people, turns out mm, you weren't actually taking anything. It was just to see how cruel you were going to be. And boy oh boy, some people are cruel. You were tempted with the opportunity to take away personal items from each other. Four of you chose not to take anything from anyone. And one of you made the harsh decision to take everything from everyone. The truth is, none of you will be losing any of your personal items. However, I still control when you can have them. The first treatment challenge that the players go through is honestly one of the worst. Basically, they haven't slept in days. We're talking probably 30, 40 hours of only two hours of sleep in that whole time. And so finally, they're given a bed to lay down and relax in, and all of a sudden, lights and sirens start blaring at full speed. The trick is, you have to enter in a number that Val tells you into a keypad in order to stop the blaring. But she tells you the number before you go to sleep, enter it wrong once, and the sirens blare all night. And of course it starts off easy and gets much worse, much faster. Contestant number eight is one of my favorites in the entire show because she is such a badass. She actually just doesn't even enter the first code and stays the whole night listening to the sirens like a gosh darn madman. So eventually for one of the contestants, number nine, it gets to be too much. And in fact, it's not even the sirens and the flashing lights that gets to him. He actually says it's because he forgot the combination. I quit because I just had no idea what that code was. I was holding on for dear life and I couldn't stand the noise anymore and I couldn't hold on for another second. So instead of enduring the lights and the sound, he would rather quit because he forgot the number. Now, you have to remember, even though number nine was the first one to go, there's a huge psychological element to this game. Part of it is how far can I go, but the other is hedging your bets. And what I mean is, if there's nine of us and we've been sleepless for about nine hours listening to these blaring sirens, surely somebody else must have quit, right? I can't be the first one to give up, and then you are. And now I need to introduce you to the most controversial character in the entire first season. And that is contestant number six. Contestant number six is a stuntman who is quote unquote obsessed with hair gel and chapstick. And it turns out that he actually wins the first challenge by completing all of the codes correctly through the whole night. And this is how he reacts to that. Number six, you have conquered every code. I could have been doing this all night long. Do you want me to be impressed? Just showing you you don't know what you're up against. Basically, I beat everyone at their best. It's early on in the game, and I wanted to prove a point that I could take them all down. I acknowledge that for now, you have established yourself as the leader. I always am a leader, so it's nothing new. After finally getting some good sleep in them, they take a much needed dance break and start penning letters to home. Now, this is one of the few times in the show where Val kind of takes mercy and pleads to the humanity of it all saying, yeah, maybe we should let them, you know, speak to their family. So next up is what probably inspired Frog Fractions, which is a hellish video that has math clues hidden inside of it. Players have to watch all of these horrific clips multiple times and try to solve the math equations in it. Now, is this a treatment? No. It's a challenge, I guess, and the challenge will give you either the ability to skip the treatment or an advantage therein, but most of the time it is skipping it. And so there's a long montage of them just getting math horrifically wrong, but just remember, these are 20 minute videos that they're watching again and again and again. You miss one thing, you have to wait a whole 18 minutes. And now it's round two of, oh, you wanted to sleep? You're an idiot. You're an absolute moron. You're a buffoon. You're a tiny little stupid piece of shit. Out rolls a bed of nails, and every player knows exactly what's next. How long can you last given five pads and a bunch of pegs all over your body? This is where you start to wonder, like, the efficacy of all of this. It's one thing to deprive people of sleep, and it's another thing to welt and bruise their backs for hours for $50,000. Which, keep in mind, is not a lot of money for having gone through this, but whatever. Number six decides to prove how strong of a manly man he is and how good he is at staying alone in a room and keeping his sanity. He bashes his head and back against the pegs. How much more I can take? 
It hurts my head. But I'll do that. Hurts my back, hurts my butt, hurts everywhere. I'm willing to deal with that pain. Nobody is having fun. There is no redeeming quality to this challenge. Everybody is in pain. Everybody hates this. Makes for really good television though. And this is as good a time of any to mention that every time somebody hits the red button before the challenge is over, Val terrifies them by saying, You have pushed the red button. You realize if you are the first person to quit, your time here will be over. Yes, I realize that. You are the first guest to quit this treatment. Every single time and actually gets fairly annoying by the end. And you can tell the contestants are also kind of like, yeah, Val, I, I get it. Okay. I, I'm a loser, Val. Yeah, and then they cut to this scene of the players lifting up their shirts and oh my god, it's bad. It's just... Oh, it's bad. It, and, it, and it only gets worse. And now another challenge to avoid a treatment is to count exactly three hours given only the tools that Val gives you, which are things like dice, cards, and a hourglass. Uh, note on the hourglass though, it counts not five seconds, not 10 seconds, it counts 12 seconds and no player seems to realize this this goes on for quite a while and players are trying to use their dice to keep track of the hours and the hourglass to keep track of the seconds even though none of them know that it's actually 12 seconds so on and so forth and eventually we get to the end where they get to lift up their dinner plate to see if they're victorious or not yeah come to find out that a lot of them spent over an hour longer than three hours and to be honest i can see how this would happen but at the same time, that feels very hard to do. It feels hard to be wrong by an hour and a half over three hours when you have an hourglass that you think does 10 seconds at a time, but I guess I'd have to be in the room to really see. Let's take this moment to talk about what player number six did. Now, I'm sure all of you have your opinions about player six already, but player six took a very different approach to this strategy. I don't know if you've seen the movie Titanic, but that movie is about three hours long, and I'm a huge fan. I've seen the movie a hundred times. I know it from start to finish. So I basically just reenacted the movie throughout my head, and uh, at the very end is when I decided to ring the buzzer. That's right. Player number six apparently recalled the entire movie of the Titanic and used that to count. And you know what? He was only off by like eight minutes. Eight minutes! Honestly, say everything you want about contestant number six. That's kind of amazing. That's, that's actually, that's actually incredibly amazing. How do you... Contestant number seven, the same one that took all of the items at the beginning of the game, has won this challenge by being just a few minutes over three hours and gets a nice T-bone steak while everybody else, uh, gets this. It's really gross. Yeah, so this entire treatment revolves around the idea of how much food can you eat? And honestly, a lot of it's not even gross. It's at worst things like pickles or maybe some Mediterranean dishes, but it's actually just about eating over 5,000 calories in like an hour. And once again, you get to see why contestant number eight is my favorite. Contestant number eight, again and again and again and again, cannot manage to get down a lot of this food, but keeps doing it up until the point where she swallows her own puke. What did you do to succeed this time? I swallowed my own puke. <laughs> That's what I did. Oh, <laughs> it's so gross. And after everything, she's actually eaten more than all of the other contestants because she failed a round and was forced to eat a penalty round, which was exactly what she had before, plus what she didn't finish. And of course, it wouldn't be a reality TV show without deciding that everybody who pukes needs to be shown on camera. So unfortunately, contestant number eight is the first one to leave, but it makes sense after everything she had been through with the challenge and she is forced to leave solitary. So now that everybody is done puking their guts out, they get to decorate their room with some pretty pictures and then lead into the next big challenge. 
they are asked to look at a series of images and remember a wrong answer to them basically for example they see a baby and are told this is a toothbrush and then at the end Val will quiz you this one is kind of boring and it ends up with two of them getting into a tie and then they do a tie break around but realistically this guy ends up getting out of the treatment and so everybody else goes into the next challenge just a quick side note i think this is actually the first time this guy won a challenge so it was a really big deal for him being able to avoid something oh and i forgot to mention before that little challenge there yeah number six had a temper tantrum number six your body has quit the treatment by vomiting now would you please make it official by hitting the red button and saying i quit no my body didn't quit i could have kept on going i just threw up I need you to say I quit and hit the red button. Val, well, kick me out if you need to, but I'm not gonna say I quit. Now either you can let me out to use the bathroom, or I'll just take a dump in this in this bucket right here. So after this little meltdown, Val actually decides to wake up contestant number six after the last challenge to try to give him a chance to calm down. How are you feeling, number six? I'm good, just relaxing. I am calculating the results of the self-evaluation and I am unable to calculate your answers. I think I'm so tired that I'm mixing up letters and numbers. I will send you another evaluation form so you can try again. Val gives him a video camera to vlog his feelings, and it's actually a video camera that is used in a later challenge. So I actually think the producers and executives didn't really know what to do with him and were just like, let's just give him a future one and see if that solves it. So he creates that little video for himself and seems somewhat calmed down, but uh, it doesn't last long. Hey Val, this show is no longer a challenge for me. So you can have someone meet me in the gray room, bring my stuff, and drive me back to my pickup point. Please stand by. The next treatment is about to begin. Yeah, that's right. Contest number six doesn't lose a challenge because to be honest he's been a formidable adversary this entire show he's lasted through almost all of the challenges and breaks down because they won't give him his chapstick and is convinced that they stole it so yeah he takes off his mic and he just leaves they end up somehow calming him down and getting him into the confession room where he realizes that he only acted that way because he was horrifically deprived of food and water and sleep deprived he kind of has a reflection moment, which kind of saves some of his character. It is negligent for anyone to underestimate the magnitude of the emotional burden my guests undergo here. I know when I came into this thing, I said I wasn't going to quit. And I guess I was wrong with only thinking that no one can make me quit, no one can break me. But uh, what I forgot to even think about was the whole point of the game, solitary. You know, you're stuck in a room, you're given a weird meal every single day, you're bored, you're yearning for that, that interaction. And the voice that I hate the most, the Val voice, there's times I just want to call on Val so I have somebody to talk to. If I disappointed anybody by quitting, I, I apologize. I think it was just time for me to leave. But despite all of the kind words he said there, let's not forget that this guy did this and this. So... I'm only affording him some forgiveness. He was a very strong opponent though. Like genuinely, he could have won the game if he wasn't so paranoid. The next treatment is my least favorite in the entire show because it is quite literally the first one without the bed. It is just, I don't have anything against kids, but crying babies drive me crazy. Human no like loud sound, make it stop. Fears hurt bad, bad. Yeah, it's not that good. So after this loud sound treatment, actually nobody is removed because technically stuntman number six removed himself. So they just kind of were like, keep playing. Then Val gives them some puppets and asks them to like vlog themselves and do some weird puppetry storytelling. They skip past it in the show a lot because I think they realized that it was a bad idea because it's not funny or entertaining. Then we get to one of my personal favorite challenges in the entire show, which is counting rubber balls. That doesn't sound as exciting as I wanted it to. Basically, the premise is very simple. Here's a bucket of balls, and we're going to toss it in your little house and tell us how many balls there are. Um, except for the fact that they turn out the lights. Yeah, that kind of throws a hamper on everything. And and then the flash, and it, 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 it sucks. It's bad. It's, yeah. When I was watching the show, this challenge actually gave me a really good point of reference. 
What you notice is by the end of the challenge, most of the contestants are slowing down and being more deliberate. And by being slower and going through every ball individually, they end up getting the right answer. It's kind of an allegory for everything that's happening. Players are trying so hard to compete that they're forgetting that if they don't treat themselves right, they'll lose. So again, this show really is reinforcing this. It's about fighting yourself. It's not about fighting anybody else. This is one of the first times I talked about contestant number five, but throughout the entire show, contestant number five is one of the funniest people without a doubt. He sees this bucket sitting in the room and he's just like, why is the bucket here? What's going on with the bucket? Watching this show, it's actually kind of hard to remember that this is a game show and not a human torture. But I was trying to think back during my time in the quarantine, like, what was I doing? You know, what, what did I do to pass the time? And on one hand, I was working a lot on a lot of my own personal projects. But I also spent a lot of time playing video games. And I imagine a lot of you did as well. Which is why I'm happy to announce that our sponsor is me. My own company. Yeah, no, that's right. Clickcraft is a company that I've been working on for months and we've launched a Minecraft server called Click Classic, which you can join at this IP address or on this website. Click Classic is a revolutionary Minecraft server that takes classic game modes and twists and turns them to make them something incredibly unique. For example, most people have heard of a factions Minecraft server. Well, we've turned that on its head by turning factions less into a battleground of you and different factions and more of a battleground against you and other factions in a Hunger Games type war zone. Then the other one is the one that I'm most excited about, which is called Skylocked. Skylocked is an RPG D&D inspired Minecraft server where your choices matter. Literally everything you do has an effect on the story. We have all kinds of different things running all of the time. You can go in and play and see different NPCs with different quests and different storylines and go along with your friends and complete dungeons and catacombs, but that is not the main point of the server. You have your own character with your own character sheet and you make changes and adapt your character to the world. We have weekly and monthly streams where we show lore stories that are being told from the perspective of players like you where we have our own personal stories that are being told out on the server and all of that is just a fraction of it because we also have an entire skyblock version of the game where you go onto an airship and now you're on a sky island and you get to play and build your own island with your own empire and your own money and everything it is an incredibly unique experience which takes the mix of skyblock and rpg adventure and mixes them in a way that you've never seen before and I'm incredibly excited to announce that July 1st will be a full refresh of not only factions, but also Skyblock, where we'll be changing all sorts of things about how it works and introducing those weekly lore streams and how your character can interact. So to get started playing today, head over to this IP address inside of your Minecraft client if you're on Java, and head over to our website where you can join our forums and our Discord. If you join from this video, once you get to the hub, all you gotta do is type slash Brandominos video, all one word. If you type slash brand dominoes video, you will get a custom tag to use in game by typing slash tags. You'll be given a absolutely awesome tag, which shows that you are one of the people that subscribes to me on YouTube and that you're kind of my favorite, but you know, don't tell anybody about that. Thank you once again to my own company for sponsoring this video. And I hope to see you all on Click Classic very, very soon. Anyway, back to the video. It is every kid's dream and every adult with vertigo's nightmare spinning around as much as humanly possible in a set amount of time. So they just start spinning. And spinning. Spin and 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 contestant number four during this whole challenge is going through hell. This poor guy is spinning and spinning and spinning. And every time he goes to press the button to say he's done, he just collapses on the ground and just rolls around like his life is over. I don't know how he did as many as he did, but he has some goddamn perseverance to get through that because he looks like he is dead. And then he throws up. And that is the end, and he is eliminated. Throughout the entire show, contestant number five has been one of the most jovial, if not a little cynical about everything. And he unexpectedly has a full breakdown during the middle of this episode. So Val ends up giving him a notepad and pen to write his own play, and he comes out with this masterpiece. Upon arriving to solitary, my head has been spinning with the experience of the anticipation of the unknown which direction to go. I hear a voice guiding me and encouraging me, but my triumph over my obstacles leads me to personal enlightenment.
This is truly the path less traveled. Okay, now we get into what is my least favorite part of maybe the entire show because it is it is so close to being good, is what I'll say. As we enter your personal mansion of fear, you will describe what you see there and unlock the doors to your dark side. This is not a challenge. This is not a treatment. This is just theater. So basically, the remaining contestants lay down in a dark room with a spotlight over top of their face. And what they're asked to do is to lay down and think about a horror scenario, which eventually leads them to finding their greatest fear and confronting their issues. Which, after all of this time in solitary, I'm sure they've spent a lot of time internally facing thinking about their own issues. So, yeah, this kind of makes sense. But if you just watch a few minutes of it, it's incredibly awkward and weird. And you can tell some of the participants just aren't getting into the role play of it, while others of them are just trying to make up things for the show. It's not good, in my opinion. And just just look, just watch some of this. Icky fence, uh, dark with the slight pungent smell of rancid decay. Number one, you are about to enter a room. Inside the room is your greatest fear. I really don't have any fears. Take a closer look at yourself. I see my face it's just upset and horrifying and just pissed off. I see that I'm unhappy. So between this challenge and the next treatment, there's actually a third thing that they do this episode. So there's like four things that have nothing to do with the actual game, back to back to back to back to back. Um, they go into a pillow rage. So they're supposed to take a pillow and draw the things that they hate on it or whatever. And some people go into how they don't actually have anything they hate and others go into how they're dealing with their divorce in a healthy way and trying to get through it through booties. It's super gross. They're like pouring paint on a pillow and just like, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't. Now we get the hottest, sweatiest, most scandalous challenge they've done yet. Should I say, Scovilus. Now it is time to turn up the heat one more notch. Or three. What's the bucket for? Yeah, the whole challenge is drinking hot sauce. How long can you hold hot liquid in your mouth? And yes, it sucks, and I'm sure it was very painful, and people almost throw up multiple times, but it's pretty much just, hey, hot. I'm not trying to be super reductive of the show. It's just when you watch it, a lot of the reaction comes from what the people are doing, and if you watch the show back to back to back like I did, they're kind of just doing the same reaction every time, and there's not much interesting content. In fact, here, take a look at how many times they say the exact same stuff or do the exact same thing again and again and again. Woo, whoa, that looks dangerous. Ha <laughs> ha. I own you, man. You're gonna help me keep warm. That's what you're gonna do. I'm gonna beat you. Too bad. Put your mouth. Swish you around, spit it out. I think the most interesting part of this is they actually lay out a platter in front of them of things they can use to try to soothe their mouths, like yogurt, rice, water. Nobody knows that yogurt is the best option because I guess in 2006, it wasn't common knowledge not to drink water, but they keep drinking water. Anybody who's ever had anything hot in their mouth ever knows that if you put water in there, it does not do a thing. It just coats the oil and keeps moving it around your mouth. It is the worst option. But eventually contestant number one does leave due to this challenge. It becomes too much and she is the first to leave. And now we get a reminder that Val is gone. The AI starts messing with the temperature and it starts to get very cold, like sub 50. And they have these very thin shade blankets, which are horrible. And now we're at a part of the show, which is kind of weird, where contestant number five, who's the upbeat, but kind of cynical, just kind of turns to full cynical and just admits, I'm going to lose. I can't win. I'm ready to do my exit interview. Isn't even a treatment. What, what, what's next, man? We need to eat fire, get buried alive, sensory deprivation. Let me go ahead and start doing my exit interview because I know that's happening real soon. This is more of a testament to how strong a lot of these people are. Like, yeah, their personalities are changing and their minds are changing, but uh, what would you do? I mean, you're spending weeks inside of this thing with no idea when you're gonna get out. You have no room to move around. You can 
poop in a separate room, which must be the most exciting part of the day, but only when teacher Val gives you permission. I mean, you have to remember, this sucks. This isn't just one challenge after another challenge after a treatment after a treatment. This is a weeks and weeks and weeks of building pain and torture onto these people. And they keep going. You'll hear it later, but most of them aren't doing it for the $50,000. They're doing it because they need to prove that they will win. They have to prove that they can do it, that they won't give up. One of the people, which is contestant number four, I think. I should remember these. Up until this point, contestant number seven is a crazy powerhouse. He has never even touched the red button to quit a challenge early. He has run every challenge to the end. And in the last challenge with the hot sauce, he never even touched anything on the platter. And now for the part that will hurt thousands of theater kids across the country. Memorizing a line to repeat back. For this test, my guests must memorize a rather maddening speech. But wait, it gets better. To see the speech, they must dunk their heads in water for at least 10 seconds. So the contestants have to waterboard themselves and come up for air after 10 seconds. And after that 10 seconds, they get to see a rerun of a script. I know it's rich coming from me because I spent most of my life in theater as like the main character with hundreds of lines, but memorizing two or three lines that are maybe a little rambly, it's not hard. I understand that they have gone through weeks of hell, like I just said, and they're being dunked underwater, but if you watch this episode, they make it way harder than it needs to be. And I think the reason is, is that they're rushing. Again, they are trying to compete against others. They're not trying to compete against themselves. And it leads to them constantly getting it wrong because they're trying to go too fast. Nobody employs like a good system or shows any competency in showing how to remember this. They're just kind of like bobbing their head underwater and coming up and trying to repeat what they just saw. And it won't work that way. And it takes way too long. And of course, Val is evil again. I promise to be good. Yeah. yeah. Number seven. You are correct. Yes! Number three. What? <laughs> You are correct. Oh, thank you. Number five. Yes. That was correct. Yes! Letting everybody get the right answer and then saying, But were you the first? But the question is, were you the first guest to recite the message exactly? Oh. But were you the first one? <laughs> oh, oh. But number five. No! There is the little matter of who guessed first. I bet I wasn't. But after all is said and done, contestant number seven is actually the first one to complete it, so he gets to sit it out and gets to go all the way to the final two, guaranteed, and getting some well-deserved rest after everything he's been through. However, for the other two, it is time for the most grueling challenge of all. They have to press three buttons around their pods as fast as possible, getting the correct amount of laps done within the set amount of time. After every few rounds, they add weight to a backpack. It is very simple. But it is very painful. Round 12. I'm just hoping somebody gave up already. I'm, I'm waiting for the treatment to quit. Round 13. This challenge goes on for hours. And I mean hours. These two duke it out for a long time, having no idea if the other person is even still in the race. After all of it, the pain and the anguish, we get this moment. Number five, congratulations. Please stand by. Number three, you have failed to complete 50 circuits in time. To continue in this treatment, you must complete another penalty round. Um, I quit. <laughs> I quit. Val comes to contestant number five to inform him that he has won in the most Val way possible. Sure, you will be able to complete 50 circuits in two minutes. <laughs> Three, two, you are one of the final two contestants. Yes! <laughs> oh, yes, indeed! Yes, indeed! And we are now down to the final two. I know I said it earlier, and I do want to just reiterate it here. These two have made it through hell. Contestant number seven has never given up on a challenge. Contestant number seven has never pressed the red button. Contestant number seven has never used any of the things given to him to assist him during the challenges or during the treatments. He has powered through all of it by sheer will. 
Contestant number five has not only used his wits to outsmart players by deciding that somebody must have quit by now and quitting a challenge early to get ahead, but he's also used his Buddhist force to chi himself out of a lot of the bad position he's gotten into. He's gone through the emotional turmoil of dealing with his divorce. Husband, perfect, significant other, you know, white picket fence. It almost happened, but it didn't happen. I'm pissed off for being used over and over and over again. Getting played is not good, especially for 10 years. You know what I'm talking about? He's outlasted a lot of what his cynicism thought he would, and now the two of them face the ultimate challenge. This is the final stop. You against the box. And soon, the box will be against you. Looks pretty sadistic. Oh, no, oh, not these again. Solitary, solitary. This little box is like finding out that the boss you were fighting has a secret second stage that you had no idea was coming. These two step inside this peg-filled little cage and are forced to cramp themselves inside while the walls slowly crush in on them with no escape, no water, no food, no bathroom. This is what TV was made for. Val uses this moment to talk more to the contestants, to learn about where their headspace was, to learn their reflections on the show, and maybe tease them with their family or show them the horrific clips from earlier again, but... Val takes this opportunity to really dive into why these players are here and how they made it. I can truly say this has been an adventure. Have you ever been in a place like this before? Hell no, I haven't been in no place like this before. What are you, what are you thinking? Sometimes uh, for fun, I would just stuff myself in a hamper. A very strange idea of fun. Just to contextualize this again, contestant number seven has never quit, but also just got the final treatment off while contestant number five just ran a goddamn marathon. Yeah, after all of that, he is now trapped inside of this box, and mind you, he is much taller than contestant number seven. Contestant number five is not short, and this box was built the same size for both of them. So do I think that the odds are stacked against him from the start? Absolutely. Do I think it's fair? Absolutely. Contestant number five had the chance to win just like seven did and could have skipped this treatment, but unfortunately couldn't memorize the lines in time. And the most punishing phase of the treatment is yet to begin. I promise you, I will push and push until somebody quits. So at the end of this torment, unfortunately, contestant number five's body gives out. I gotta say, after contestant number five gives up, this is one of the most frustrating scenes to me in the entire show, without a doubt. I remember as a kid being mad at this, I was like six or seven or something, and I was so mad, and I rewatched this a few years ago, and rewatching it now, I'm just as angry. Contestant number five and contestant number seven are being monitored 24 seven. There's no way around that, right? Everybody's watching them, and I'm sure there's therapists and doctors making sure that they're fine. Contestant number five starts to have really bad cramps and starts to go through a lot of pain inside of this box until he finally quits. He hits the button and he ends his experience in solitary. His body is failing him. Every time I maneuver, my body cramped up even more. I did everything I could do not to scream. And so is his mind. Someone's going crazy. Oh. Oh. Extreme pain. My body was spasming and, and, and I was cramping up. Oh. 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 I gotta quit. I gotta quit. I gotta quit. Please, can I open the door? They leave him in this box for obviously minutes, and he is trying his best not to scream or be mad, from what I can tell. Number five, are you all right? I gotta quit. I acknowledge this. With so much on the line, I am sorry that you are no longer able to cope with this treatment. It's okay, me too. You know that if you are the first person to quit, your stay in solitary will be over. I understand. Number five, you are the first person to quit. Oh. Think about it like this. Have you ever had a cramp before, like a really bad cramp in your leg? Most of the time, you can like move your leg and undo that cramp. He can't. There's no moving his legs. He is so tall and the box is so confined that he can't move. So here he is, cramping up, going through immense pain, 
and the walls are not retracting. The box is not resetting. Val is just talking to him like, hello, contestant number five. How have you been? You've had a good day? Congratulations on making this. And the contestant's just like, yeah, Val, I'm doing great. And with that, Solitary is over. The last gag of the show is that contestant number seven is locked inside of that little box until Val can find nine new replacements, which hinted at a continuing of the show into a next season. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Oh, thanks. They sealing me in now? I have grown rather fond of number seven. And I have yet to make him crack. Perhaps he should remain and entertain me until my next nine guests arrive in solitary. I think it's a beautiful send off to the show and I think it's very funny and it obviously alludes to another season, another chance for people to come on in and show what they've got after seeing the first season. It would have sucked if there was never another season and number seven just died in that box, but luckily for him there was another few seasons. Hello, my name is Val. <laughs> is this even legal? Oh, God, this is so hard. To push. That's the most pain I've ever felt. To pod. <laughs> and we won't get into them today, but maybe in a future video if you guys like this one. So let's take a moment and let's look back on what this show actually was. For the time, this was revolutionary. Back in 2006, reality shows like Yo Mama, Flavor of Love, and Family Jewels were all of the rage, and Solitary was something very different from those experiences. Sure, you had Fear Factor, and you had The Amazing Race and Survivor to kind of show more, you know, human limits, but Solitary was a very unique take on this, where instead of a group of people being a bombastic show piece or whatever, it was about the individuals. If you actually watch the series for yourself, which I heavily recommend, I actually watch it on Amazon Prime, it's like five bucks, but it's, it's definitely worth it if you liked this. Going through and watching their individual stories and their progression and their character is actually really touching. It talks about the human spirit and the sentiment of fighting yourself versus fighting everybody else. There is so much about Solitary that looking back was revolutionary for the time. This idea of a rogue AI that was kind of based around Hal from those times, but there weren't many other examples to go off of. Computer runs a laboratory of experiments, very much inspired Portal a few years later. Now, how much? Probably not that much. As a matter of fact, Portal only came out about a year later and was well into development by the time this show aired, so I doubt they took much inspiration, if any, from the show, but it's funny that two things that are very close in, in idea and style came out at the same time. Solitary had some very progressive stuff and they didn't play it for jokes. Anybody who was alive in the 2000s knew that if there was a gay character or a character that wasn't a Christian or a character that was kind of emo and goth-like, they were almost always played for jokes and belittled or baited into getting audiences that enjoyed those things to watch the show only to realize that they were going to make fun of them for it. This show had gay characters, had goth characters, had Buddhist characters, all kinds of people with different beliefs and views and, and, and they treated them with respect. And obviously today that makes perfect sense and it's what should have always been. But if you watch any show from the time, they were belittled, they were made fun of. And of course, some characters in the show are making fun of those things. I think number six says something about I'm too straight to do blank or I wouldn't want to be seen as gay or whatever. But, you know, those sentiments were still alive, but to have the show not address them as anything other than the person that they are and the things that they experience is kind of wonderful. It's very progressive for the time. This show wasn't scripted. There was no planning. There was no producer pulls me aside to talk to me. There was you and Val and the idea of winning. Solitary set out to complete and accomplish one thing. Prove that you had more strength than you thought if you pushed yourself past your own limits. A lot of shows have this theme, but Solitary took it to a completely new level. And for that, it will always be one of my favorite reality TV shows, even if some of the later seasons are, um, not good. If you want to see me cover the next few seasons, like season two, three, and four, go ahead and leave a comment and like the video and subscribe. Do all the normal YouTube stuff. It would help me out a ton. And of course, all of this support means the world to me. I look forward to you watching some more of my videos and hopefully some of the other ones like the Stardew Valley retrospective pique your interest or whatever YouTube is recommending from the future. Uh, I hope you like those videos as well. But as always, when you're ready for another video, you know where to find me. I'll see you then.